I was intrigued with Dr. Weinstein's remarks this morning about symposium and drinking because my profession, I'm a lobbyist for the beer, wine, and spirit industry. <laughs> and it turns out that Lincoln, the one that we love so much, was a temperate individual. I thought I'd start today with just a few remarks about Lincoln and his legal career, although you're certainly going to hear a great presentation, but I was intrigued about what happened on March 24th in Lincoln's history. In 1836, Link, this is from Lincoln Day by Day, Lincoln's name is entered on record of Sangamon Circuit Court as person of good moral character, the first of three steps in obtaining his law license. So it's quite a day. On March 24th of 1843, Lincoln wins two divorce suits, and he represents a plaintiff in three cases and a defendant in others. So he had a great way of being on both sides of individuals. In 1847, Lincoln is attorney for John Calhoun in six cases, and all are continued. All of you in this audience that are attorneys know how we love to continue cases. In 1853, he had 21 cases on the docket. In 1854, only one of six cases that he had came to trial. True day in a lawyer's life. In 1855, Lincoln has a busy, though not very successful day in court. In a slander suit, the jury finds against his client. And finally, in 1860, we have a combination of both law and politics because it notes that he's busy in court Lincoln writes to Samuel Galloway of Columbus about the presidency. So this is Lincoln from Lincoln's Day by Day. It is my pleasure as an attorney to introduce another attorney to speak about a third attorney, especially when the attorney I am introducing is Mark Steiner, and he is here to speak to us today about Abraham Lincoln in the role he held for five times longer than that of president, that of an attorney. Mark, currently an associate professor of law at South Texas College of Law, has been a law professor for nearly two decades. He has taught the basics, such as torts and legal research and writing, and more specialized classes in American legal history and Asian Americans and the law. Mark was a Fulbright Scholar in 2005, teaching at National Taiwan University College of Law. However, Mark is not only an attorney and law professor, he is also a specialist in his side of Abraham Lincoln that is not frequently enough, at least in this attorney's mind, discussed his law practice. Mark received his Ph.D. in history from the University of Houston in 1993, having written his dissertation on Abraham Lincoln and the antebellum legal profession. Following his dissertation, Mark has published numerous articles. It is clear that Mark has an extraordinary depth of knowledge and research on which to draw in talking us today about Honest Abe's Honest Profession. I want to uh, thank Mr. Pascal for the kind introduction. I'm particularly grateful that he did not mention the sales figures for my book. <laughs> I want to do, uh, thank the Abraham Lincoln Institute for inviting me here today. This week I've been thinking about this uh, wonderful opportunity, and I, and I was talking to my wife about it, and I said, Lee, wow, can you believe this? In your wildest dreams, did you think that... I'd had my book published on Abraham Lincoln's law practice, and in your wildest dreams, did you think that I'd be invited by the Abraham Lincoln Institute to speak on a panel with Lincoln experts like, you know, Douglas Wilson? And she looked at me and she said, Mark, I've got to be honest with you, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> I had an early uh, email about the schedule, and at that time I had the uh, idea that I had an hour to speak, and uh, today I found out I have 35 minutes. Um, I, I think I'm okay. I've, I've cut out all the good parts, so um, I think we'll be timely. Um, last fall, my, my book on the law practice was published, and um, this spring, a second book on Lincoln's law practice will be published, one by uh, Brian Dirk. 
Now, the two prior books, the last two books on Lincoln's law practice that covered his whole practice, they were published over 40 years ago. Um, John Duff's A. A. Lincoln, Prairie Lawyer, and John P. Frank's Lincoln as a Lawyer. And so, uh, you know, one question would be, why is there such apparent disinterest in his law practice? And if you look at the Lincoln biographies, the treatment of the law practice has tended to be very anecdotal. It examines only the uh, same four or five cases. So if you, you know, most biographies look at the same four or five, that it become, has become kind of a canon. So they'll look at the Manny Reaper case, the Illinois Central Tax case, the you know, Duff Armstrong case, and, and that's about it. Um, the early biographers who were weaving a, a portrait of a, a, a narrative of a saintly emancipator or robust frontiersman faced a real problem in writing about Lincoln's lengthy legal career. Americans seldom have considered lawyers particularly saintly or virile. In fact, Americans have generally disliked or distrusted lawyers. Their lawyers have been disliked throughout American history because instead of you know, serving the public interest, they serve merely their client's self-interest. And they've been trust, uh, distrusted, much like uh, actors were uh, distrusted for a long time, because lawyers never present their authentic selves in public. When, when they're in a courtroom, they're presenting their client's interest. And you never know if a, you know, a lawyer, when he says something in court, is that what he believes, or is just that's what he's saying you know, for his client? Um, I was reading the, the new book on Lincoln and Chief Justice Taney, and, and Taney, in an 1819 uh, courtroom appearance, talked about how terrible slavery was. And the, the author said, well, you know, this is proof that Taney at the time was an anti-slavery moderate. Well, maybe, but maybe not. We don't know. I mean, he was saying it in the courtroom. And any time a lawyer says something in the courtroom, you, you never know, you know, if that's his belief or not. And because of that, you know, people have been uh, distrustful of lawyers. So we have this negative cultural image of lawyers, and then we have this positive cultural image of Lincoln. And these are the two primary reasons that early biographers generally have paid very scant attention to Lawyer Lincoln, because this image of Lawyer Lincoln um, clashes with the image of Lincoln as frontier hero or the great emancipator. Um, Lincoln biographer Stephen Oates once explained that Lincoln comes to us in the midst of legend as a homespun rail splitter from the Illinois prairie, or his father Abraham, the great emancipator who led the North off to civil war to free the slaves, and after the conflict ended, offered the South a tender and forgiving hand. And within these images, there's very little room for a successful lawyer. The situation has changed somewhat in the modern biographies, and the quality of the treatment of the law practice has certainly improved. The space devoted to the law practice has not. And in one sense, Lincoln biographers are very little different than any biography of a lawyer who is famous primarily for doing something else. Um, legal historian Robert Gordon notes that previous work honored by lawyers have talked about almost any aspect of their careers other than how they made a living. If a lawyer becomes a judge or a politician, says Gordon, his biography usually devotes only a perfunctory early chapter to his law practice, mentioning only his involvement in famous cases or notorious trials. Gordon's explanation of this inattention is that the details of day-to-day -day practice often seem trivial, repetitious, and boring, even to those whose living depends upon them. I mean, Herndon you know, apparently agreed in his biography of Lincoln. He begins the one chapter by saying a law office is a dull, dry place. Uh, so the, another reason for this uh, lack of interest or inattention would be the biographer's lack of legal training has also prevented more attention to Lincoln's law practice. And this is kind of self-inflicted. Historians have said, oh, we, we don't, we're not trained in law, so we can't do this. And I don't, that's not true. But um, the historian David Donald in his biography of William Herndon stated, there is no definitive study of Lincoln's law career because the terminology of the law itself is a sufficient barrier for most investigators. Donald explained how even those obvious distinctions between traverses and demurs, between mandamus and quo warranto, between real property and chattels, can hardly be made in other than the formal legal language, which is itself inexplicable to the layman. Donald also noted that the state of the documentary evidence presented problems for the study of Lincoln's law practice. Most of the court records were scattered at that time throughout courthouses in Illinois, and many of the records are incomplete because of the destruction or theft of legal papers relating to Lincoln. I mean, that, one of the 
great things that happened when the Lincoln Legal Papers went across all the courthouses looking for Lincoln Papers. They found that when the, the people did come to you know, steal Lincoln documents, some, they didn't realize that there were documents that Lincoln wrote in his hand, but he signed another attorney's name, and they didn't steal those. Or they would just they would just cut out his signature, so we'd have the document. And his handwriting is, you know, really just, you know, very distinguishable. Um, so they found a lot of documents, you know, as a result, um, even though they had been well combed before by thieves. The uh, professionalization of Lincoln Studies also has not overcome this lack of interest in his law practice. You know, we uh, heard about James G. Randall's essay in uh, 1936 earlier, and he complained then about the hand of the amateur has rested heavily upon Lincoln scholarship. Yet Randall failed to suggest that historically trained scholars might explore Lincoln's law practice or that the law practice was one area where there was both spade work and refining work to be done. In 1979, uh, Link Marky Neely uh, re-examined uh, Lincoln scholarship since the publication of Randall's article. Unlike Randall, Neely saw the need for spade work in legal history. He said an area where professionalism has been slow to command. He saw legal history as a promising route for a, fr uh, for a fresh understanding of Abraham Lincoln. Interestingly, Neely uh, almost completely neglected Lincoln's law career in his, his 1993 biography of Lincoln. He spent two paragraphs on Lawyer Lincoln. Uh, one paragraph was an explanation on why he wasn't spending more. Um, <laughs> instead, that um, his professional life remains inaccessible to the uh, historian. The problem is largely archival. He complained that documents from Lincoln's law practice yield information grudgingly. And he believed that without transcripts of trials, it's impossible to know that what happened in the courtroom unless the trial was sensational enough to be covered by newspapers. And second, he pointed out the antebellum legal system used antique terms and obscure forms that have since been discarded. And these are not instrumental, uh, insurmountable problems, though. Um, David Donald accurately noted in uh, 1948 that the, about the documentary problems that scholars face in, uh, who are interested in Lincoln's law practice. And, and that problem just completely disappeared with the uh, Law Practice of Abraham Lincoln Complete Documentary Edition was published in 2000 because not only did the Lincoln Legal Papers go out to the Illinois courthouses and gather all these things, they then did the next step because of technology, which was to scan them and digitize them and then put them on DVDs. So you don't even have to go to Illinois to look at all these documents. And then um, there was a foundation or underwrote um, the purchase of this collection for every uh, ABA accredited law school in the United States. So there's you know, hundreds of copies out there. So, you, you know, it, it was a great boon for research. And it's, a, and it's you know, like state of the art because you can do searches on it. You know, it's a, search, a searchable database. You can find out things like, well, how many times did Lincoln did this kind of trial or that kind of trial? Before now, it's always been very impressionistic. You're like, well, Lincoln handled many trials of this type, you know, or he seemed to handle a few. Well, now you can, you know, give the numbers on it. All right, the, um, Donald you know, also became the first Lincoln biographer to use the materials from the Lincoln Legal Papers Project, and this is before they had been digitized. He came to Springfield, and in his uh, 1995 biography of uh, Lincoln, he said that this was the most important archival investigation now underway in the United States. And although he finished uh, his biography several years before it was, uh, the project was complete, the, the book does show the influence of the project. One chapter on Lincoln at the head of the profession of the state was based on hundreds of unpublished documents in the files of the Lincoln Legal Papers, and he thusly gave a fuller sense of the breadth of Lincoln's practice, and he included cases that previous biographers had ignored. He gave examples of cases in circuit courts of no great interest or consequence to anyone outside the parties involved in the litigation. So he got past the canon of that handful of cases. But other Lincoln scholars have continued to uh, devote scant attention to Lincoln's law practice. Late William Gnapp, for example, generally avoided the law practice in his Lincoln biography. He followed a very similar path, um, very familiar path. He briefly discussed or alluded four of the usual suspects, the Effie Apton case, the Illinois Central Tax case, the Duff Armstrong murder trial, and the Manny Reaper case. And he, he thus highlighted the same cases that uh, Albert Beveridge had talked about 75 years before. There's, there has uh, been one group that's an um, exception to this lack of interest in Lincoln's law practice, and that would be lawyers. Um, with the publication of Frank's books and Duff's books, th that brought the total of uh, full-length treatments of Lincoln's law practice to six. 
All six have been done by lawyers. Um, my book is the, the seventh full you know, treatment of his law practice, and I'm also a lawyer. But I'm, I, you know, I do have a Ph.D., so I'm, I'm partially rehabilitated. Um, <laughs> but Brian Dirk's book will be the uh, first book, first full treatment of Lincoln's law practice, uh, not written by a lawyer. Uh, um, so the, the lawyers have been attracted uh, to Lincoln for uh, very obvious reasons. Um, I, in my book, I say that lawyers were trying to uh, get Lincoln's mojo. Um, and I always thought someone would take out the, you know, tell me to take the word mojo out. And um, no one ever did. And so it's, it's in, now it's in the index. I, I, did, I, I did the index. If you look under um, Lincoln, it will say mojo. Um, <laughs> I thought in case someone was looking for that, they should be able to find it. All right, the, um, but I think the study of Lincoln's law practice does pay dividends, um, particularly now with the um, legal, you know, publication of the legal papers. And it's also true this is a, a very propitious time to study because in the last 40 years since Duff's and Frank's books came out, there has been um, an incredible uh, outpouring of works on legal history that are complementary to the study of Lincoln's law practice. There's a lot of antebellum work being done and that help uh, you know, understand what you know, Lincoln was doing so you can put what Lincoln was doing in proper context. And, um, one, and you know, I look at um, different things. One thing I look at is Lincoln's legal education, how he studied for the law, and, you know, the influence of John T. Stewart, who um, there, there wasn't much of a barrier to get into the, to the um, legal profession at the time. And what you really needed was just a sponsor, and, and John Stewart became his sponsor. And that early period in Lincoln's uh, studying for the, for the, um, to become a lawyer is very well covered in Douglas Wilson's uh, Honor's Voice, The Transformation of Abraham Lincoln. But, um, like, for example, you know, New Salem resident Henry McHenry, I'm beeping something up here. Um, William McHenry, uh, Henry McHenry said that Lincoln was so absorbed in the study of law at this time that people said he was crazy. And, the, um, and what he did, and unlike most lawyers, he didn't apprentice. And he, and he, uh, he didn't go to law school. Hardly anybody was going to law schools in those days. But, but most would-be lawyers would apprentice in a law office, and he didn't. As Lincoln said, he studied with nobody. Um, and, you know, so he did, although he didn't apprentice, his reading for law was similar in breadth to those who did um, train that way. And what he m missed out on was the copying of documents. It actually was probably a pretty good deal for him. Um, but his education and training was uh, more unusual when compared to other prominent members of the Illinois Bar. Most of them had attended some college or law school. And so, but his minimal preparation meant that his legal education continued throughout his career. And as lawyer Lincoln only read law books uh, when he had to, um, but he ably used those to find answers to legal problems. He, he wasn't a diligent student of the law, um, but when he was pressed by necessity, he was a sophisticated user of the available use, uh, sources of legal information. And his, his um, minimal early training and the rapid changes in antebellum law ensured his legal education continued throughout his law career. And although he told would-be lawyers to still keep reading after becoming licensed, when he read, it was for that case. He would read because he needed to read for that case. Uh, Hernan believed that Lincoln, quote, never studied law books unless a case was on hand for consideration. Da uh, Judge David Davis, who saw Lincoln on the circuit, similarly believed that Lincoln read law books but little, except when the cause in hand made it necessary. Lincoln, according to Hernan, was in every respect a case lawyer, never cramming himself on any question till he had a case in which the question was involved. And Hernan wrote that Lincoln never followed up the decisions of the Supreme Courts as other lawyers did. The, uh, his second partner, Stephen Logan, later recalled that Lincoln's knowledge of the law was very small when I took him in. Logan explained that I don't think he, ever, he studied very much. I think he learned his law more in the study of cases. He would work hard and learn all there was in the case he had in hand. He got to be a pretty good lawyer, though his general knowledge of the law was never very formidable. But he would study out his case and make about as much as, of it as anybody. And, and this was typical. His approach to reading law books was typical for lawyers then and, and lawyers now. Although Herndon noted that Lincoln never read much law, and I never did see him read a law book through, he completed that sentence by noting, and no one else ever did. 
Lincoln, uh, lawyers read purposefully. Lawyers, as legal historian Michael Hoflick notes, read to acquire knowledge with a specific end in sight. They seek to find the specific nuggets of information they require for purposes wholly external to the text itself. John Littlefield, Littlefield who studied law in Lincoln Herndon's office, later described Lincoln reading law books. Lincoln's favorite position when unraveling some knotty law point was to stretch both of his legs at full length upon a chair in front of him. In this position, with books on the table nearby and in his lap, he worked up his case. And his approach can be seen, Lincoln's approach can be seen in his actions he took after he was mailed a catalog of law books. He kept the catalog, so it's, it's in the Library of Congress papers, and it listed over 1,100 English and American treatises by subject. And so he kept it, and he, uh, he folded it back up, but he also wrote at the top of the outside of the envelope, too deep for me. <laughs> and one thing that he, he didn't do was he, kept, he didn't keep a commonplace book. So what lawyers would do, or some lawyers would do, is when the, you know, the reporters would come in, they'd read the reporters, and they'd summarize them, and they'd make little notes on subjects, and they'd organize their little commonplace books, and they'd have different subjects, and when the cases came out, they'd write those, and then they would have those cases at hand. Um, this was done you know, particularly by 18th century lawyers. In the 19th century, commonplacing is, is starting to die out, and uh, Joseph Story, the uh, Harvard law professor and Supreme Court judge, thought that they were being, these commonplace books were being, being replaced by the publication of case-finding aids like digest and abridgments. And um, Lincoln also had, um, for case-finding, um, used Herndon. So Herndon, as the junior partner, did much of the legal research for the firm. Albert Taylor Bledsoe, who practiced law in Springfield in the 1840s, remembered Lincoln did his reading, as some men do their religion, by proxy. By his good man Friday, William H. Herndon, who of creditable zeal and industry would collect all sorts of cases and authorities for him. Um, and Lincoln would reply on Herndon's research skills and, and Herndon later wrote that many people would flatter him by saying that he made out the best briefs in the largest law cases and that Lincoln would argue his case from these briefs and get the credit for them while I was the power behind them. Um, Herndon, however, understood the division of labor in the office. In an 1857 letter to abolitionist Wendell Phillips, he wrote that Lincoln was the hoss and he was the runt of the firm. And Lincoln also relied on other lawyers for legal research. In a letter to uh, a Lewistown attorney, Lincoln wrote, be sure to send a brief with the authorities in it. He wrote Newton Deming and George P. Strong to prepare on the question of jurisdiction as well as you can. And Martin B. Dryden, Lincoln and St. Louis lawyer uh, John Crum, who later was the circuit judge, um, would hear Dred Scott's original freedom suit, uh, represented the appellant, but it was Crum who presented the court with an extensive printed argument with legal authorities. But he didn't delegate you know, all research to other lawyers. He also hunted up cases in the law books. Um, because he didn't read legal reporters as they were published, Lincoln used treatises and digests to find relevant cases. You know, he didn't commonplace, so he didn't know where the cases were before he started researching. And these treatises, and there had been an explosion of treatises in the early 19th century, and Digest provided Lincoln and other antebellum lawyers a way to study out a case. And American legal treatises would then serve the practical needs of American lawyers like Lincoln. Um, American lawyers had to research these cases because th they had to figure out, for one, because um, most things were kind of in play in the 19th century, whether uh, English common law applied. So if we'd have an English common law rule, but did it apply? Um, English common law, as stated by uh, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, was not to be taken in all respects to that of America. As Lincoln observed, the decisions of our, country, our courts were conforming, as they should do, to the nature and wants of our country. But, um, so Annabelle and lawyers not only had to be uh, familiar with, like, you know, in Illinois, uh, the Illinois cases, but they also researched uh, decisions from other states. They'd also, would, you know, because of the importance of English common law, they researched English decisions. If you look at the... Um, you know, what we have left in terms of documentation. Lincoln's often citing cases from out of, you know, outside of Illinois, and he's citing English cases. Um, finding these cases for antebellum lawyers was burdensome. Uh, every profession, an antebellum observer noted, has grievances under which they groan without the sympathy or even knowledge of others. For antebellum lawyers, their grievance was the sheer number of books. Courts were primarily responsible for the bewildering bulk, complexity, and multitude of law books. And legal treatises, then, would be used to find the cases. You'd read the treatise because it would have footnotes. And you'd go to the footnotes to find the cases. 
Um, Lincoln would rely heavily on these legal treatises. Uh, we have documentation of Lincoln citing at least 36 treatises in 47 trial and appellate cases. That's 30 different authors. 20 of them uh, were English authors. Um, he would, he, he, although he didn't read these books until necessity forced them, uh, when forced, he effectively used what was in his law office and in the Supreme Court library. Uh, there's a motion for rehearing in Patterson v. Edwards, a slander case. Lincoln offered to furnish the court if they desire with a new edition in two volumes of Starkey on slander. So he knew that the judges didn't have access to that book. That's why he was offering his new edition from his library. In another 1847 motion, he said um, he relied on one of the latest editions of Chitty's pleadings and then stated the edition was in the library of Messrs. Lincoln and Herndon, which I hope they will allow use of to the court in the investigation of this petition. He also kept a mental inventory of the treatises in the Supreme Court Library. In an 1857 letter to co-counsel in an admiralty case, he wrote, I understand they have some new admiralty books here, but I have not examined them. He also relied on published digests of reported cases. Digests uh, summarize, have give little summaries of cases by subject areas, and they, they would be unranged under a system, uh, system of classified headings. And again, this means that lawyers didn't have to read everything as it came through with all the different published reporters. They could stay abreast by things by looking at the digest. So um, they could use these digests to find cases. The, um, and, and they also became a substitute for the cases because not all the reporters had all these, uh, not all the lawyers had all these reporters. And he often used these digests in appellate cases. His favorite was the United States Digest, which was the first comprehensive American digest. In a, a one contract case, his clients had lost in the trial court. Lincoln argued that the client's non-performance of a contract was excused by an injunction against the plaintiff that had affected the property that was the focus of the argument. To support this argument, he gave one citation and one citation only. One U.S. Digest, 540, Section 66. That was it. Uh, he won the appeal and the court reversed the judgment against the clients. In the uh, court's opinion, they quote, without attribution, the black letter law statement from the digest that he had directed them to. They then cited seven cases. They're all from the digest. The first five were in the same order as they appeared in the digest. So when he cited that digest, he had done his job. He had gotten the law to the court. Um, he also relied on the Illinois uh, digest, which collected decisions from the Illinois Supreme Court. And so in one brief... Lincoln cited Illinois cases to support a successful argument that the appeal should be dismissed because the judgment was against three defendants while the appellate bond named only two of the defendants. Uh, he didn't look long for authority. I, 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 my former colleagues at the uh, Lincoln Legal Papers uh, did a little write-up on finding this brief, and they said, you know, this shows how Lincoln researched his cases and he worked hard. And, and um, so I got the Illinois Digest, and it took me five minutes to find the cases. So I'm thinking it took him less than that because um, he was used to using the Illinois Digest. Um, so he didn't look long for authority, but all three cases were in the, the, the section you'd expect him to be in. They were in, uh, on appeals and writs of error. All right, the, um, a theme that I, I develop in the book is that of Lincoln as a, a Whig lawyer. That's why I want to talk about my remaining time. Um, as a lawyer... Um, Abraham Lincoln developed a distinctive Whiggish attitude toward law and the role of law in American society. Uh, politically, Whigs like Lincoln were modernizing conservatives. They favored uh, inter internal improvements such as railroads to foster economic growth. But they also believed in the rule of law and that, that law provided a neutral means to resolve disputes. So Lincoln was a, legal, a Whig lawyer who embodied the Whig reverence for law and order. So if you look at Lincoln, if you look at his, um, like his early speeches and the importance of railroads, but then you look at his practice, and he's often called a railroad lawyer, which I think is misleading because that sounds like someone who is suing railroads or representing railroads. Lincoln took business as it came. So in some counties, he sues railroads. In other counties, he represents railroads. Um, but if he was true to the economic agenda of Whigs politically, why would he be suing railroads? Because of their importance. You know, but the, the, the Whig value on law was to just settle these disputes. It didn't matter what side you were on. Um, so he, I think he essentially had a political conception of what a, the lawyer's role was. And this also defined what an honest lawyer would be, um, represent clients faithfully. What unified his practice was uh, the importance of order and law. 
And he wasn't, he wasn't a saint, and he wasn't a consistent advocate for corporate interest or economic development or even railroad interest. He had a service mentality. He was ready to represent any client. But uh, Whig lawyers like Lincoln were more than just mere legal technicians. They also stressed the importance of lawyers serving as guardians of community values. And so he was interested in mediating and settling cases as he was in trying them. And the, the good example of that are the slander cases. Um, and, and I like looking at the slander cases for other reasons. Um, slander cases are this great window into uh, the social history of the 19th century um, because it's one area you can find how people actually spoke. Um, the, um, the pleadings in the slander lawsuit had to say exactly what the defendant said, not um, he said I was a bad person. Um, the language would be there. You know, um, and so my book actually should have a parental advisory sticker on the cover because the language is pretty, um, pretty strong, which I find comforting because we always think we have this declension from our forefathers, but no, they, they cost a lot. Um, I was going to, I, I see the stop sign. I was going to, uh, let me quickly say one other thing very briefly. And, you know, we have this Whig lawyer concept, and what I write in the book about is the Matson case. And that's where I see kind of the problems with the Whig lawyering. If you don't care what side you represent, that meant Lincoln doesn't care when he represents a slave owner. Uh, trying to assert property rights in an African-American woman and his children. And to me, that it shows the limitations of this concept of wig lawyering. But, I'll, but I will stop there because I saw the sign. I can hear you. Um, offhand, I can't recall any. And on the legal treatises, I don't, I don't remember uh, Puffendorf or Vittel being cited anywhere, but I have a, um, a, a, I have a chart of the, what he cited, but I, I don't remember those works being cited. So I, I don't think there's a lot. Um, it's, it's mostly all positive law, you know, in the, in the courtroom. I mean, it's, all t it's talking about court decisions and statutes. All right. Um, okay, the first question is a very tricky question, um, but I think I, I think we can figure out an answer. But the problem on looking, you know, like on a win loss record, you know, if you you can now do this in their database, you can figure out win losses. But we don't know how strong a case things were. I mean, you you can see that he lost a case, but what does that mean? I mean, was it? it it said of one of my colleagues that he takes the cases that can't be won and loses them. Um, <laughs> but, and so the, in the same way, we, it's hard to tell by like a one loss record whether he is good, but by people seeking him out, you know, who sought him out as their lawyer and the, his general reputation that way, I think he's, he was pretty good. All right, so, and then as uh, an author with a book on his practice, I'd have to go with a 10. Um, you know, one one to ten. Um, no, so I think he was he was he was pretty good. He was well respected, but it's hard to tell from the records. Um, the it was an informal examination, and it was an oral examination, and it wasn't intended to be a a rigorous examination. And and that tradition continues until the uh, early nineteenth century. 
I mean, I'm sorry, the early 20th century, do you have, you start getting standardized bar examinations. There's no record of his exam, but you can read about other Illinois lawyers and, and they've written about their exam and you're given a few questions and then you're expected to buy drinks for the examiners. <laughs> There is, um, and I'll just mention as an aside, in Texas, um, in the, the early 20th century, in uh, West Texas, there was a cowboy who wanted to become a lawyer, and so uh, he studied for a little bit, and he went to the uh, same thing as Lincoln would have done. He went to this panel of lawyers who asked him a few questions, and they said, well, what's the difference between fornication and adultery? And he, and he looked, and he said, I've tried them both, there isn't any. <laughs> He, w he was passed. No particular reason. Um, no, it's 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 hard to separate things in Sandberg's book, so it's you, know, it's you get distracted, I think, reading it. Yes. Could you tell us why Lincoln became a lawyer? What inspired him to become a lawyer? Was there somebody in his life who was a lawyer, etc.? And also, could you address the extent to which his status as a lawyer uh, informed or didn't? Okay. Um, well, the easy answer is look at the relevant pages in um, Honor's Voice on um, why he became a lawyer, what he was thinking about. He, he thought, it, I think he was searching for something, to, you know, a profession, and thought something this, that he could do. He initially um, thought he didn't have the education for it. He thought about it and then thought, I just don't have the education for it. And it was um, Stuart who encouraged him when uh, they were in the legislature together, Stewart encouraged him to become a lawyer and, and be in fact, you know, in effect became a sponsor and he would come to Stuart and Dummer's office to, to borrow books. Uh, and so I think that helped him along. Um, I've always thought, I didn't put it in the book, I always thought it was the, um, that one possible reason why he might have been attracted to law was the uh, problem of land titles in Kentucky. Um, but no one's ever... You know, looked at that, and um, I don't have any proof of that. But, um, and what, what was the second part? Yes, um, I, I really don't have as developed an answer on this as I should because one thing I tried to do when I wrote this is I didn't want to, some lawyers when they've looked at this, at Lincoln, you know, um, they'll say it's great that um, you know, Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War because he was a lawyer and actually it's just great we had a lawyer in the White House, didn't have to really be Lincoln. Um, but, and I think that claims too much for the law practice. I wanted to do a, consciously avoid kind of seeing what Tracy had during the civil, you know, while president and then go back and trace him back to the law practice. But, um, no, if you read like the, um, you know, Lincoln-Douglas debates, it, it, you can tell how it's framed, how he looks at things and how, among other things, it, it, you know, practicing law gave him, I mean, you can tell by the way he researched cases. He, he could be a quick study on things. He showed that during the Civil War. You know, um, he could organize his thoughts inc incredibly well. He could present himself incredibly well. So I, 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 it, I, you know, I'm positive it trained his mind in that way. The other thing, um, being a trial lawyer, is um, his kind of uh, theatricity, you know, um, in how he presented himself. And so in, in, uh, in um, Hernan's Lincoln, um, there's a, a quotation by one lawyer that talked about how Lincoln would uh, lull people 
by saying, you know, you, they press a point and he'd say, I reckon, and they, and then he'd get to the point where he's going to, you know, zap them on, and they, they had been lulled into that, and then, you know, I think the quote is that they ended up in a ditch. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and he, does, he does the same kind of things. Um, in the Tawny, um, Lincoln and Tawny book I was reading this week, uh, they're talking about the prize cases, and he says, oh, I'm just a country lawyer. I don't know about those kind of prize cases. And, and so I think he did things sort of just like at trial and dealing with other lawyers that people would underestimate him. But he had already plotted it all out, exactly what he was going to do and where he was going to get them. It made him... It, it, it's a combination. He was uh, really good at impro improvisation, but also at the same time had things kind of worked out on, you know, how, how things were going to develop. There's, we got two of them, and then we got to quit. But okay. to please speak in the mic because we can't record the questions. If okay. Here. All right. Yes. Speak in the mic. Theory that. Um, in cases where he really didn't believe in the cause or the client, he exhibited less zealousness than in other cases. And so I'm wondering if, if your view is the record supports that. And, and second, it, it does strike me, maybe this is more of a comment, that Lincoln spent a, seemed to have spent a great deal of time thinking about whether the war power was an exception to the taking, takings clause when he was thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation. And I don't know if a non-lawyer would have worried as much about that. Yeah, I think the comment's exactly right. Um, I've already forgotten the first part. I'm sorry. Uh, but being less zealous if you didn't really believe in the, the oh, clause or the client. Okay, I don't think that's true. And the reason I don't think it's true is nobody said it while he was practicing law. And this is all said later. And I think it has something to do with the role morality. That this is a way around the role morality. That he wasn't just a hired gun. That if he didn't believe in the case, then he, wouldn't, he wasn't committed to it. But that, you can't find anybody saying that you know, contemporaneously. It's all later that people have these recollections. So I'm, I'm dubious about it. And, and on the other, and again, though, we have the problem, how do we know it's a, uh, you know, was it a weak case or a strong case? You know, they lost. Was it because Lincoln didn't believe in the cause or it just wasn't a very good case? The Matson case, he lost, but he was going to lose. Uh, under the law, he's going to lose 10 times out of 10. You know, so um, people used to say he threw the case away. There was nothing to throw away. He, he was on the losing side of that argument. He could not win that case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.